Hello and welcome to Indus News Live from Islamabad. I'm Jawad Tehami and these are the headlines. Israel's warplanes have attacked the Gaza Strip for the 10th consecutive night. Israeli Defense Ministry says it struck Hamas infrastructure and a military compound in retaliation for the explosive balloons and rocket attacks. No casualties have been reported from the raids so far. The United Arab Emirates says several other Arab countries are on their way to normalizing relations with Israel. In a virtual interview, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs Anwar Gargash said the region needs a strategic breakthrough. He said Abu Dhabi's relationship with Tel Aviv will bring a warm peace as UAE has never fought any wars with Israel. The U.S. has formally notified the United Nations of its demand to restore all the sanctions on Iran, citing violations of the 2015 nuclear deal. In a letter to the U.N. Security Council President, Secretary of State Ahmed Pompeo said Tehran is guilty of significant non-performance regarding the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. China, Russia and other UNSC members to the agreement questioned the legality of the move as Washington unilaterally quit the accord in 2018. Former Vice President Joe Biden has accepted the nomination for the president on the fourth and the final night of the largely virtual Democratic National Convention. In his speech, Biden said if elected, he will end the season of darkness. Biden will take on the Republican Donald Trump in the presidential election on November the 3rd. Brazil has reported 1,204 deaths and over 45,000 COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours. In the US, 1,055 people died overnight, raising the toll to over 174,000 with more than 5.5 million infections. India has recorded 983 deaths in the last 24 hours, increasing the tally to nearly 55,000 with over 2.9 million cases. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, 10 more people lose their lives to the virus, taking the count to 6,219 with over 291,000 confirmed cases. Globally, the virus has claimed more than 793,000 lives while infecting over 22.6 million people. Headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. We start our news bulletin from Gaza Strip where Israel's warplanes have attacked for the 10th consecutive night. Israeli Defense Ministry says it struck Hamas infrastructure and a military compound in retaliation for explosive balloons and rocket attacks. The ministry said the targeted infrastructure was used to construct tunnels. No casualties have been reported from the raids so far. Tensions have been rising for over a week now. Israel has also closed the Karim Abu Salim goods crossing with the Gaza Strip. In a related development, the United Arab Emirates says several Arab countries are on their way to normalize relations with Israel. In a virtual interview, Minister of State for Foreign Affairs Anwar Gargash said the region needs a strategic breakthrough. He said Abu Dhabi's relationship with Tel Aviv will bring a warm peace as the country has never fought any wars with Israel. Gargash also said UAE's embassy in Israel will be in Tel Aviv and not in Jerusalem. Israel considers Jerusalem its undivided capital, but the Palestinians see the eastern part as the capital of their future state. UAE signed a peace deal with Israel last week, becoming the third Arab nation to do so after Egypt and Jordan. 
Meanwhile, in Yemen, the Saudi-led coalition says it has intercepted and destroyed a booby-trapped drone in the south of the kingdom. Coalition spokesperson Turki al-Maliki said the drone was launched with the Houthi militia from Yemen's capital, Sana'a. Cross-border attacks by rebels have escalated since May, when a truce prompted by the coronavirus pandemic expired. The Houthis regularly fire drones towards Saudi Arabia in breach of international law. But the majority of the drones are shot down without causing any fatalities or injuries. Moving on, the U.S. has formally notified the United Nations of its demand to restore all the sanctions on Iran, citing violations of the 2015 nuclear deal. In a letter to the U.N. Security Council President, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Tehran is guilty of significant non-performance regarding the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Pompeo said Washington will do everything it can to enforce the U.N. sanctions on Tehran if they are violated. China, Russia, the EU, three and other UNSC members questioned the legality of the move. Moscow rejected the proposal, saying Washington cannot trigger a snapback as it is no longer part of the Iran nuclear deal. The UK, France and Germany said the proposal is incompatible with the 2015 treaty while urging Tehran to return to full compliance without delay. Iran's ambassador to the UN, Majid Atakht Ravanchi, said Washington was misleading the world with lies and fabrication. Today, the US attempted to mislead the international community by resorting to lies and fabrications to supposedly initiate a mechanism under Resolution 2231. According to conclusive legal facts, the US is not a JCPOA participant and has no right to trigger the so-called snapback mechanism and its arbitrary interpretation of Resolution 2231 cannot change this reality. The Security Council will now have 30 days to adopt a resolution to extend the sanctions relief for Tehran. Otherwise, the measures will automatically come into effect. Now, moving on, the U.S. has reaffirmed its commitment to withdraw forces from Iraq within three years. In a meeting with the Iraqi Prime Minister Mustafa al-Kadhimi in Washington, President Donald Trump said U.S. forces have significantly withdrawn from Iraq. Iraq's state media said Trump stressed the need to respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the country. While a White House statement said Trump agreed that ISIS was destroyed due to the combined efforts of the U.S.-led coalition and the Iraqi security forces. It said Iraq and the U.S. should work closely to ensure that ISIS is rendered incapable of posing a threat again. The statement said COVID-19 pandemic has further highlighted the importance of working together to build a prosperous and stable Iraq. Al Qadimi is visiting the US for the first time since he became the Prime Minister in May this year. Former Vice President Joe Biden has accepted the nomination for the president on the final night of the virtual Democratic National Convention. In his speech, Biden said if elected, he will end the season of darkness. This report has the details. The fourth night of the Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee marked the highest point in Biden's political career. His nomination is the culmination of decades-long public career for the former senator who failed in his two White House bids in 1988 and 2008. A 10 minute long video spanning Biden's lifetime of service was played before he virtually appeared on stage from his hometown in Wilmington. Amid the raging pandemic, the typical fanfare of the DNC was missing. Biden urged Americans to choose hope over fear. It's time for us, for we the people, to come together and make no mistake. United, we can and will overcome this season of darkness in America. We'll choose hope over fear, facts over fiction, fairness over privilege. I'm a proud Democrat. And I'll be proud to carry the banner of our party into the general election. So it's with great honor and humility, I accept this nomination for President of the United States of America. A group of former Democratic presidential candidates held a virtual roundtable to give resounding approval of Biden's candidacy.
His former rivals urged their voters to unite behind Biden and the vice presidential candidate, Senator Kamala Harris. Senators Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, former South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg and others lauded Biden's decency and leadership. This is clearly the most important election in the modern history of this country. And Joe Biden, you have a human being who is empathetic, who is honest, who is decent. And at this particular moment in American history, my God, that is something that this country absolutely needs. And all of us, whether you're progressives, whether you're moderates or conservatives, have got to come together to defeat this president. Biden will take on the Republican Donald Trump in the presidential election on November 3rd. In the U.S., President Donald Trump's former advisor, Steve Bannon, has pleaded not guilty after he was arrested and charged with fraud over a $25 million fundraising campaign to build a wall with Mexico. Bannon waived his right to appear in person for his initial court appearance in keeping with COVID-19 safety measures. Bannon, 66, was among four people arrested and charged by federal prosecutors in Manhattan with conspiracy to commit a wire fraud and money laundering. In a press conference, Trump said he does not know anything about Bannon's fundraising campaign. Trump has struggled to build his border wall, a key 2016 campaign promise in the face of court challenges, logistical hurdles and congressional opposition. Brazil has reported 1,204 deaths and over 45,000 COVID-19 cases in the past 24 hours. In the U.S., 1,055 people died overnight, raising the toll to over 174,000. With more than 5.5 million infections now, globally the virus has claimed more than 793,000 lives while infecting over 22.6 million people. More in this report. The coronavirus pandemic continues to wreak havoc across the globe as governments scramble to secure vaccine deals. Latin America's combined death toll has crossed 250,000, while Mexico is set to receive 2,000 doses of the Russian vaccine to test among its population. Although Brazil's infection tally has exceeded 3.5 million, health experts claim the infection spread is slowing down in the country. For the first time since April, the transmission rate of COVID-19 is slowing down in Brazil. According to this data from the Epidemic Control Center at Imperial College, the rate of contagion in Brazil was 0.98, a number that indicates how many people an infected patient can spread the new coronavirus to. In Europe, the UK has removed Portugal from its quarantine list while adding Austria and Croatia. France has reported 4,711 cases overnight, a level last seen during the height of the epidemic in the country. Germany has also reported its highest daily toll since April with over 1,700 new cases. While in Australia, the second most populous state of Victoria has reported its lowest rise in fresh cases in five weeks. Meanwhile, New Zealand has put off the decision to ease restrictions in the biggest city of Auckland until next week. Auckland has been at level three for 10 days now, and we did say we would check in on those settings today. As a cabinet, we have done that by looking at the latest information. There is nothing to suggest we need to change our course, and certainly nothing that suggests we need to escalate our response. But at this stage, we need to stay the course and retain the settings we have for now. In Asia, mainland China has reported 22 new imported cases with no domestic transmissions. In South Korea, the virus fight is reaching a critical phase as 324 virus cases were reported, the highest for the first time since early March. Moreover, India has witnessed an abrupt surge in COVID-19 cases as the country's caseload crossed 2.9 million. The health ministry says nearly 69,000 infections were reported in a day across the country. The ministry says 983 people lost their lives overnight, bringing the death count to nearly 55,000. The ministry said there are over 692,000 active cases in the country. It said the state of Maharashtra is the worst affected, making up more than 37 percent of the country's cases. India remains the third worst hit country from the coronavirus pandemic after the US and Brazil. 
Meanwhile, in Pakistan, COVID-19 active cases have dropped to 11,790, while 10 people lost their lives overnight. The health ministry says 630 people tested positive in the last 24 hours. The country's death toll has risen to 6,219. Well, the total number of infections crossed 291,000. The health ministry reported a recovery rate of over 93% across the country. Sindh remains the worst hit province with over 127,000 infections, while Punjab has reported nearly 96,000 cases. More stories to follow, but right after a short break, stay tuned. Welcome back in Belarus. Opposition politician Svetlana Tineskaya says, uh, called on supporters to step up their strikes as factories across the country to try to force new presidential elections. In a video address, she told her followers not to be fooled by intimidation. Meanwhile, the US says it supports an independent international probe into electoral irregularities in the recent presidential election in Belarus. US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said Washington stands by its long-term commitment to support the country's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Pompeo also said Belarusians have the right to choose their own leaders and want states of intervening in the country's biggest crisis. The European Union has levied sanctions on Belarus until February 2021. Russia says Ukraine should stop making excuses for not fulfilling their obligations under the Minsk agreements. In an interview, Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said the constitutional consolidation of the special status of Donbass is the key to resolve the crisis in Ukraine. Lavrov said Kiev must follow the unanimous agreement of Normandy summit participants over a pact between Donetsk and Lugansk. He said all the matters related to special status of the three regions should have been reflected in the new constitution of Ukraine before the end of 2015. Earlier, Ukraine's presidential office said four more locations in the eastern Donbass region will be cleared of armed forces. Relations between Russia and Ukraine soared when Moscow annexed Crimea in 2014. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has gone into a coma after allegedly being poisoned. Navalny's spokesperson Kyra Yarmish claims he fell sick after drinking a cup of tea laced with poison. She said Navalny started feeling ill upon returning to Moscow from Tomsk in Siberia by plane a day earlier. Yarmish said he is in intensive care and on an artificial lung ventilator. Navalny, a lawyer by profession and an anti-corruption activist, is a fierce critic of the Putin administration. Navalny's personal physician has confirmed the opposition leader was poisoned with an unknown agent. France and Germany announced they were ready to grant medical treatment and asylum to Alexei Navalny. In Thailand, police have arrested nine activists over protests against the military-backed government. In a statement, police said those arrested were charged with breaching internal security laws and defying an emergency decree that banned public gatherings. Thai police said the arrests of the protest leaders have been made under the law. Police also arrested prominent activists and lawyer and in Nampa during a protest. The activists were charged with sedition and could face prison sentences of up to seven years. All were later released on bail. Nampa was the first to openly break the taboo earlier this month, calling for reforms in the monarchy. Meanwhile, some protesters have called for curbs on the power of King Maha Vijari Longkorn. In Mali, the coup leaders say they will hold elections in a reasonable time, promising to respect the international agreements in the fight against militants. This comes as the opposition-backed military junta said the detained president, Ibrahim Boubacar Kiyata, is safer in their hands for now. Coup leaders said the transitional president will be appointed drawn from either the civilian population or the military. The opposition leaders say they will hold a rally in Bamako today to celebrate their victory. Leaders of the West African states say they will dispatch envoys to coup stricken Mali to help secure the return of the constitutional order. The opposition rejected ECOWAS stance on Mali despite UN Security Council and European Council also condemning the military's actions. 
Ils veulent venir. Today there have been debates between the ECOWAS heads of state. You already know the results. They want to come, they will come, but we won't move. New Mali. We want a new Mali. And that is why tomorrow we are calling out on our people, inside and outside Mali, to come out massively. The opposition coalition spearheaded months of protests against Kiata before the coup and has since embraced the mutineers. Bamako residents have also expressed a widespread support for the coup. Now moving on, in Pakistan, 24 people have died in torrential rains overnight in different parts of the most populated Punjab province. A rescue official says several were injured in rains which devastated the central region of the province. The official said four people were killed and five wounded when the roof and all of an old house collapsed in Lahore. They said nine members of a family were buried under debris as the roof of their house broke down in the Shekhupara district. Three people lost their lives in different incidents of electrocution and roof collapse in Faisalabad. Five people were killed in Mandi Bahauddin after another roof collapse. In Chakwal, three laborers lost their lives after being stuck in a coal mine during the rain. In the U.S., dozens of wildfires raging throughout Northern California have claimed at least five lives and threatened tens of thousands of homes. Authorities said more than 30 civilians and firefighters have been injured by the uncontrolled blaze. At least nine fires raced through hills and mountains in the North Bay's wine country, destroying more than 105 homes and other structures. Dozens of lightning-sparked wildfires are growing rapidly, forcing tens of thousands of people to evacuate homes in the San Francisco Bay Area. California has been hit by its worst lightning storms in nearly two decades. Governor Gavin Newsom has declared an emergency in the state and warned people to embrace for more hot weather conditions. Three crew members on board the International Space Station will spend the next few days fixing an air leak in the vessel's Russian segment. In a joint statement, US, NASA and Russia's airspace agency Roscosmos said the astronauts will also search for the source of the leak. It said the crew, comprising of NASA's Chris Cassidy and Russia's Ivan Wagner and Antony Ivanishin, will close the station's hatches. This will be followed by monitoring the air pressure and then finding the source of the leak. NASA says the agency and its international partners first noticed a slight increase above the standard cabin air leak rate in September 2019. The joint statement said the situation represented no immediate danger to the crew or to the space station. Asian markets are trading higher following the release of mixed U.S. economic data overnight. The U.S. Labor Department says initial weekly jobless claims state side have come at above 1 million. South Korean stocks bounced back from losses a day earlier as Seoul's cost gained over 2%. Mainland Chinese stocks are also trading higher. The Shanghai Composite has advanced by nearly 0.5%. While well, the Shenzhen component has jumped over 1.5%. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index has risen more than 1%. Meanwhile, shares of Alibaba listed in Hong Kong recovered from an earlier dip to rise 0.86%. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 has risen by 0.26%. While the Topics Index added 0.39%. Australia's S&P ASX 200 fell by 0.14%. Oil prices are also higher with international benchmark Brent crude futures up 0.33%. Another weather situation from around the globe. That is all for now with the latest updates. You can follow us on social media at Indus.news.